Hi, Tallgrass family. I'm Erin Rye, and I'm a member of the Filmmaker Advisory Board, and I am so, so excited to introduce you all today to Saida Bello Osagi, and she is the director of the film Tinge, and just a little bit about her background. She went to Penn, so you know she's smart. Uh, she's worked at Tribeca. She's worked at Kickstarter. She has been around friends, and now she is a filmmaker, because, hey, she's here, and also an aspiring TV writer writer, which I am too. So that's exciting. Um, hi. Hello. Hi. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. Welcome to the virtual tall grass. <laughs> I love what you guys did with the place. It's honestly, it's beautiful. <laughs> great. We try. Um, <laughs> So I, I loved, loved, loved your film. And just for anyone, it's part of the romance block. So, you know, get in there and watch some, you know, exciting, romantical things happen. Um, but I, I'm assuming anyone who's here has watched the film, if not spoilers ahead. Um, can I just say, I connected so much to your film because I felt like it was the embodiment of what all of us have been through when we're like waiting for that person to text us back. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. And like, we've yeah. all been that person. Mm -hmm. It was just yes. like, you know, oh my God, now I've sent three text messages that say good morning and I look like a crazy person. <laughs> so that exactly. felt very real to me. Um, is Was it real for you? I, yes. I mean, like I haven't exactly done three good morning texts, but something along the lines of that for sure. Yeah. For sure. and, and I love how like, um, you know, you just start to feel crazy and mm -hmm. you really I, it's like I felt like what was happening with her externally and also the fantasy sequences is what happens in all of our heads mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when we're in that moment. Yeah. Uh, why did how did you decide to use those fantasy sequences to kind of represent that inner struggle? Yeah. So, well, I guess I'll go back to the inspiration behind yeah. Tinge and everything. And um, so Tinge, definitely a portmanteau of two very popular dating apps, yeah. um, two of which I were frequenting when I was in between <laughs> jobs. Um, and yeah, I just remember feeling really out of my body, you know, just like messaging and swiping on all these random strangers. It became this mindless game. And then you're talking to someone and then you match with them and then you like develop this connection with them, even though you don't know their last name. And then like, boom, you get ghosted and you're just like, what's going on? Like, how am I so invested in this? Like, you know, this entire scenario. And I was talking about it with different friends and they were all, you know, relating to it. And they're like, yeah, I also feel just crazy messaging these different guys. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've always been really into like surrealism and fantasy sequences. And before I had, written tinge I watched obvious child with Jenny Slate um and I think that was one of my big inspirations for the film just like a New York City set romance um and she has that um Gillian Rogue Pierre has that one sequence when they're in bed I don't want to spoil obvious child either but there was this amazing sequence that she had that I thought was so amazing because it just takes you it doesn't like take you out of the movie but it's just like this great skit that she has. And I was like, ooh, I like that. I like mixing fantasy with reality. Um, and yeah, I was just playing up on that. And I was just inspired also by like Greek mythology, hence the different sirens um, that were on the subway that were following the main character. Um, yeah, so I've always just been interested in combining fantasy and reality. Sometimes that's how I feel in real life. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, you really captured that thing after a first date, especially one with as much buildup as these online dates have, because mm -hmm. for anyone who doesn't date online, lucky you, um, <laughs> there's so much conversation that happens before you even agree to meet. Mm -hmm. so Definitely. Can, like, really build it up. And then yeah. I loved that, like, seeing her in the... Was that a wedding dress? Was that what you were going for? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like a wedding dress. She's like, I'm basically married to her. Right. And that's kind of what happens. Like you, you build it all up and you have this great first date and you're like, great, we're married now. <laughs> right. Like wedding bells. And I just, you know, had a drink with them. But yeah. Um, and then for like, I loved how she turned into like this monster or this kind of like beast. Mm -hmm. And at first I felt like, oh, she's, um, she's captive to the, uh, the, 
the beautiful woman in the wedding dress. Mm-hmm. Then I started to feel like she was hunting her. Mm-hmm. Um, is was that intentional, or, or like how did you how did you think about you know how to portray that kind of beast monster character? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I remember when I was writing notes for costume, aka my two friends. I was like, I like Tramp, the Chaplin Tramp character, just like oh. really, you know, downtrodden. And but that's not to say that that's what I thought. That was like the purpose that I thought the main character would serve in the movie. But just in terms of looks, like someone who was just like really downtrodden, like kind of covered in soot, like kind of just at the bottom you know what I mean like just at their lowest um but yeah I do find it interesting the whole hunting thing because that is kind of how it is when you're dating it just feels like this weird thing you're hunting them you're playing this game with them and you have this end goal in sight so I definitely wanted that to be um evident in the movie especially when she's lurking and she's literally crawling on the streets of East Village like chasing after the bride because that's her end goal like she doesn't even see anything um, outside of that scope but yeah definitely that um there was some amazing acting and obviously I, I thought the acting was great and then I was like oh and now they're on the ground crawling around and like they really went there right? yeah like, that's for sure. not um it's not something you're asked to do every day as a film actor mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I'm curious about your cast where did they come from how did you find them how did it all come together yeah, um, well, it's, act- it's funny, the whole casting scenario, because when I wrote the film Tinge, I actually wrote it with someone in mind. So I actually wrote it for somebody, so to speak. Um, it was a friend of mine who isn't an actress by trade, but she's super talented. And I think she can you know, portray drama and comedy very well. Uh, but of course, after I wrote Tinge, she was like, oh, um, I do, I will be out of town. Like I am kind of busy, I can't. And I was just like, okay, cool, cool, cool. So I'm gonna actually start casting now. <laughs> um, so I did the classic, you know, backstage and asking around for any cool actress, actors and actresses. And um, yes, yeah, so we went on backstage and funny enough, we had found someone who was going to be the main character. Um, and I feel like it's all funny when all these different things happen in Murphy's Law happens because it was all very serendipitous because the person we had as the main character, Saskia, is so talented. So um, great. I loved her. I loved her. And it's just funny because at first um, she was actually going to play the date character and another woman was going to play the main character. But then the woman that was supposed to play the main character had a conflict um, outside of that. And then I was just like, oh, like, do I make the date character, the main character? But Saskia was like, oh no, like I have the lines ready. Like I know all these things. And she like knew how to do her own makeup and her own wardrobe. And she had like improv a lot of the different lines and the scenes. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And she's this incredible um, now junior at Tish studying acting. I know, I was just like, ah, oh, you Tish kids. Like you're always so prepared, like honestly. I'm jealous. I'm jealous. No, I'm jealous. When I was a junior at Tisch, and no one asked me to be in a short film this good, okay? <laughs> oh my gosh. You're a junior at Tisch. That's incredible. Yeah, I went to Tisch. <laughs> That's, wow. Chef's kiss. <laughs> Julie, chef's kiss. Um, no, yeah. So Tisch kids, shout out to Tisch. Um, and then, yeah, I found the siren characters um, through my casting call, as well as the roommate character. And then the date ended up being someone who was a coworker of the casting director and so she actually had never acted before but there was something about her that my um, friend was like okay I think you can definitely play this role and play it well and she was amazing and she really just like opened herself up to the character and I was like that's so amazing I wish I was able to do that as a non-actress just like act (laughs) yeah well and she was so striking like she she was just Mm -hmm. so beautiful and you could Mm -hmm. see she had like just a an, an innocence yeah this like openness that was really beautiful yeah she was she's so amazing and yeah she definitely embodied that energy yeah well that's such a fun you know I feel like um so much of what happens on a film set is 
an accident Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, or a mistake that you turn into something cool or something collaborative that somebody else does that you as the director don't even see. Right. And then when you're in the edit, you're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Right. Um, Yeah. And so I'm kind of curious, other than the casting, which sounded like it had a lot of like different iterations. Mm -hmm. um, Was there anything else that that felt like kind of a happy accident that you maybe thought was going to be a failure or or something you didn't even know was happening that then you were excited about? Yeah. um, Yeah. Like I remember there were just different scenes and location and just shooting um, in subways and around New York isn't very easy, especially if you don't have have a permit. Um, But it was I guess it was funny, like we had to take out different scenes in the bar. They were gonna like talk in the bar and then they weren't gonna talk in the bar and we were figuring out how to shoot that. Um, I just remember that it was really nice just as we were talking about collaboration, it was, it, you just realized that as the writer and director, that had, does not mean that that's necessarily like your film. Like it's your brainchild and everything, but it's a whole team's film. And you have the first AD who's thinking about like all these different ways to shoot. And they're like, okay, maybe you can take out this scene and the producers that are like, okay, let's move everything outside instead of moving it inside. Um, so little happy accidents like that, that now looking at the film, I'm like, okay, that was definitely the better move. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? It um, totally makes sense. Yeah. Like yeah. it's, it's just, it's cool. It's cool to see everything unravel. I, I, I'm blanking because I remember there were just so many things that they were like, okay, we're going to move this. We're going to go from the F train to the G train. The G train isn't going to go for another hour. There's a delay. So we're going to take it back, like walk downstairs. And so it was just a lot of those type of scenes um, that we were moving around. But yeah, it ends up working out. Cool. I am also, I mean, I'm kind of curious. I know this is like such a basic film festival question. Like, what was your greatest challenge? But um, obviously you had a lot of challenges with, locations Mm -hmm. and filming in New York without a permit which like Mm -hmm. oh my gosh go you I'm gonna call you sometime (laughs) Um, (laughs) and uh but like was there what was what was really like the hardest part for you of Mm -hmm. from start to finish anywhere along the line um of getting this film made and out in the world into festivals sure um yeah I mean on a base level there was the locations aspect just dodging everything especially because so many of my scenes were filmed on the subway and making sure that you cut people out that because I just love how people even when they see that there's something filming and there's like a boom and everything all the people on the subway are like staring like looking at the camera and I'm like sir ma'am please (laughs) like please don't do this um but then on I guess a bigger level I think because it was my first film that I made it was the imposter syndrome that Mm -hmm. came with it all that slowly dissipated um, as the whole production schedule and shooting happened. But I just remember waking up at six or five that morning when we were first shooting. And I was just like, I've never told a cast and crew what to do. Like, how does this even happen? Like, I want to be assertive. I don't know what's happening. You know what I mean? And I mean, thank God, it's just kind of, you know, fight or flight, you just jump into it and you're with the group of people that believe in the same project that you believe in. And then you realize, okay, I'm not alone in this and it doesn't have to be so scary. And I can always ask my DP what they want or what they, um, you know, just like asking them like, okay, like just making sure everything's okay. And um, yeah, just learning how to also check on everyone and making sure that everyone feels comfortable and okay throughout the days. That was, I think, my biggest challenge was just the imposter syndrome of becoming a filmmaker. Yeah, it's well, and I love how, what you just said at the end of becoming a filmmaker, because it's like one day you're a person who's like in pre-production on a film and the next mm-hmm. day you're a filmmaker. Right, <laughs> right. You're making a film. Right. Yeah. Like there was definitely a 12, 24 hour difference. I was like, oh. Yeah, you're like, now I'm a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I also love how you um, how you got through that because I think some for some people, there is um, there is a tendency to want to pretend you know everything mm-hmm. and asking questions and just being confident in what you don't know and being able to say to your DP, I don't know what lens you're using, but I want it to look like this. Right, right, exactly. You know, like that is so valuable because that's how you're actually going to 
learn things. Mm -hmm. Oh, I learned so much on the set. I was like, oh, yes, of course, sound, mixing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, sound. Oh, sound. Oh, how, yeah. man, sound in New yeah. City. How was that? I, yeah, I just remember that was also, um, that was just a challenge because we were, um, I mean, the sound guy that we had, he's Jeffrey, he's great. Um, and thank God, you know, someone knew how to do sound because, you know, you have all the external sounds of people on the street. And then um, I think it was the Smith and then street stop that we chose. We chose that location where the sirens confront the main character. Mm -hmm. um, and we chose it because it's apparently like the tallest subway out of all of them subway station, like the highest. So we like wanted enough stairs so that when she's like walking down, 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 like you can like see the characters like following her. Um, but I didn't realize, bless you. I sneezed. Oh, I tried bless, not to. <laughs> bless you. Thanks. Um, yeah, and I remember like we didn't realize that there was this whole like squeaky noise that I think was also a happy accident um, when they're talking, when the two sirens are talking to the girl. Um, there's like a squeaky noise. It's like, er, 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 er. And, like we were waiting to see if it would end, but it was just because it was a really old subway station. And I think it added to the eeriness of the scene. But I remember I was like, oh my gosh, like this is constant, actually, <laughs> like a constant sound that you just have to roll with. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is quite a challenge, but I will say like, I didn't, I'm a, I'm a sound nerd and I didn't notice anything that really out of place. So just saying. Amazing. Oh, <laughs> shout out to the sound, the sound mixers. Shout out to the sound mixers. <laughs> um, it's funny. I don't, I feel like audiences don't realize how important the sound is mm -hmm. unless it's really bad right exactly <laughs> then exactly. everyone notices but when it's good no one notices so, so if yeah. you didn't notice the sound that means it was very good <laughs> yeah um and yeah. those siren characters so i was very intrigued by them um how and i'm gonna ask the question that the audience would ask um, I've been to enough film festivals. I feel like I know them. Were they real? Were they in her head? What were they? Ooh, good question. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, they were in her head, so to speak. But, you know, sometimes a lot of these characters that are in your head just feel so real because they're confronting you with real life scenarios. You know what I mean? So, you know, they're in her head, so to speak, but they were kind of these looming fears that were following her around throughout the entire day that mm. were just manifested in these two women. Um, but it's funny, that is a good question because even I like go back and forth on it. Cause when I wrote it, I was just like, yeah, whatever. Maybe they're just these like two hipsters from Bushwick that like actually secretly know her life and are just like following <laughs> her around in the form of sirens. And then I was like, well, I mean like, so yeah, I, as of now they're in her head, but maybe a couple months ago, they were virtual hipsters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I have to ask this, um, maybe I'm too old, maybe this is what the kids dress like, but to me, they looked like they were dressed very early 90s. Was right. that purposeful or is that just like what Gen Z people dress like? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny, like I'll see people on TikTok, like my outfit to wear to go thrifting. And I'm like, oh, that, that was the outfit <laughs> that was like in that movie. But yeah, for me, like my, two friends that are like, you know, style icons, they style them and I wanted them to be, you know, definitely stand out. Um, their styles are pretty, you know, 90s, early 2000s. So a lot of their items within their wardrobe were aligned to that. Um, but I wanted them to just be like super eccentric and one have like more of like a reddish, like orangish vibe and the other one to have a cooler vibe so they could balance each other out. Um, and there's like this one photo, um, it's like an old photo, I think from the Odyssey, the two sirens that are on an island. And there's like this like one redhead and this one like brunette that's just like chasing them like on the boat. And I was like, oh, I want them to just like have that air, you know what I mean? And they actually were like, one was a redhead, one was a brunette in yeah. the film. So they aligned to that, which is cool. Awesome. I love all these mythological inspirations. I think it, it gives the film depth. You know? Death. Yeah. I love Greek mythology, you know, like Percy Jackson. I'm like, ooh. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's like um, something I always, uh, that's interesting as a writer is that every story you can think of has been told. 
Mm -hmm. So like the main basic stories of humanity have been told since the time of Greek Mm -hmm. plays and Roman whatever. And now I feel like it's just bringing a different perspective to each of the stories. And that's what I thought you did so well is that you you showed this really vibrant, it was so New York, right? Like it couldn't have been anywhere else. And you Mm -hmm. showed, you know, kind of New York as it really is, which is not so glamorous as Mm -hmm. it looks in Sex and the City or whatever, and is more colorful than it looks in Girls. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But like, that's the reality of of living in a big city. So yeah, I thought you did that beautifully. And so it it is, it's kind of this like classic story, but through the perspective of your New York, right? rather than Woody Allen's New York or whoever else is. Yeah, thank Um, you. Awesome. Um, I am curious about how you funded the film because mm. for, for a first uh first 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 of all great job for a first short film that's crazy <laughs> thank um, you but also i know that can be such a big obstacle to all of us in getting started and doing our thing so mm-hmm. what was your process like of figuring out how to fund it yeah for sure um well there wasn't a real process um because i i had debated on making a kickstarter you know and mm-hmm. um crowdfunding through that route um And I feel like there were already things that I was like investing in or I don't know, I guess I already had decided that I was going to spend my money anyways. And I was like, you know, first time filmmaker, like you're going to have to spend your own money. Like I hate that that's the whole thing. It's like, yeah, spend your own money. It's like, oh, but yeah, I mean, I did spend my own money for the most part, but I think that's where like connections and people that believe in your project come in because, um, like my editor, who was honestly a godsend, like super, like he made the film what it is, Aaron Peer. And um, I had known him because he had worked at this post house and this person that I knew from my other job, like owned the post house. And so, you know, like it's all about, you know, discounted rates and like Mm -hmm. my locations person knew the owner of the bar and so like there was just a like small flat rate that we used for a holding space because you know when you're walking around New York you have so much so much everything the equipment to carry around everywhere so I was like okay that's cool um yeah like feeding people pizza or vegan pizza if you're vegan (laughs) and like just figuring it out like it was super just scrappy and like trying to limit as much money as I spent um but yeah I don't know it kind of just worked out that way I mean I guess a couple yeah no that's really that's really how I funded it honestly I feel like and now knowing now what I didn't know then um definitely coming up with like a strategy for funding your films and applying to grants and crowdfunding and like creating a whole campaign like those are all things that are really helpful and amazing but at that point I was like I just want to make this film you know right now but yeah yeah and I think even um I was in I was in a a panel yesterday about micro budget features Mm -hmm. and even then you know one person was like well I put my life savings into it (laughs) then some other people came on board because there was already money in it (laughs) right exactly exactly sometimes you just have to put it all on the line yeah it's Um, what a life of a filmmaker. It's so, it's so wild. Well, that's yeah. awesome. And I'm so glad. Honestly, I'm so great. I'm so glad for you that you didn't have to go through crowdfunding. <laughs> Not this time, you know, you, Just yeah. make your first one and then right. next time you can deal with all that. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Just have like show that you, you know, can maybe make a film. Yeah. And then you have something to show for it when you're mm-hmm. asking people for money. Well, look right. at what my first film did. Right, exactly. Yeah. Oh, That's so cool. So wise, Erin. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's been so great talking to you. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. I feel like time is getting away from us. But I really want to know before we go, what is next for you? Either and, and oh, no, I'm going to ask you my version of this question. Ooh, so yes. um, what is actually next, right? Mm-hmm. Or what is the, the things that you're working on now? Mm-hmm. But then I also want to know, what is your dream project? Like if you could make mm. any film or write for any, write any TV show, like what mm. would that dream project be? Ooh, okay. I love these questions. Like amazing. Um, 
Well, what's actually next for me, I'm working on two pilots. Um, I'm redrafting one of them and currently just working on that. Um, outside of that, I work for on a television show, um, assisting a director. So that's that in terms of what's literally next. Um, and then my dream, I mean, I as soon as you asked that question, I just thought of Michaela Cole, like I may destroy you this summer. Honestly, I don't know if I was as creatively inspired as I was this summer when that every single week that it would come out, I was like, of course I have to write. Like, I just, you know what I mean? Like, I have to be like Michaela. Like, I just have to like think. And I just, I love, what I love about what she does is that she's so good at bringing like the African diaspora as a West African woman. And I'm also West African. My family's from Nigeria um, and like bringing that, but like also her experience as being like a British woman and, you know, me as an American woman as well. Like I love those stories and bringing those two things together. And um, I just feel like those stories are starting to show up more and more and more. And so, yeah, that's something that I would love to work for her or work on something with her. Um, and yeah, I mean, those are, that would be kind of the dream. I would love like writing something like an Afrofuturist um, story or like a modern twist on an African folklore um, story. So those are, that's kind of actually what the pilot is around, but yeah. Yay. Oh, that's so exciting. I love that. Um, if any of you out there, Tallgrass fans and family, uh, don't know about Afrofuturism. It's really cool, and you should check out some Afrofuturist work. Um, Saida, do you have any any recommendations for them to get started? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I don't know, a little like Mati Diop, like Atlantics. That's always a classic. Um, what else? I know that there are a couple of really cool projects that are going to be coming out. Um, there's a society, a, a, a black female collective called New Negress Society. Um, and they have some things coming out that are really cool. Um, I'm blanking, but yeah, it's definitely out there. It's happening. Um, I'm a big fan of N.K. Jemisin. I don't, it depends on the book. Some of it's like fantasy and some mm. of it's sci-fi and so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some of it's futurist and some of Ooh. it's like, we're just on another world. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Like we're just, we're, yeah. yeah. Oh. But I highly recommend her work and I think they're making something. Somebody is in development with one of her novels. Oh, so incredible. anyway, like big, big ups to N.K. Jemison and all of the Afrofuturists out there. <laughs> big up, big up to my Afrofuturists, you know, just wake up. <laughs> well, awesome. Thank you so much, Saida. This was so fun and so great having thank a conversation you. with you. And thank you for showing up and, you know, sharing with our, our tall grass family. Oh, um, thank you guys so much. And yeah. oh, and um, plug, oh, yeah, you can we find you and follow you. Yes, um, you can. I just always remember, I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, so you can follow Tinge's uh, journey at tinge underscore film on Instagram. And you can follow me at <laughs> Apple Cider, S-A-I-D-U-R. It's a pun on Twitter and Instagram. But yeah. Amazing. Everybody go follow the film. Give it, give it likes, give it comments, give it all the things because, you know, the industry cares about that nowadays. So let's do it. Um, awesome. Awesome. Thank you again so much. And thank, thank you, you all for tuning in. And we will see you soon, I'm sure. See you soon, Tallgrass <laughs> community. Awkward wave. Bye. <laughs>